News of the Times, Serial Killer Saturdays, The Pantin Massacre. Welcome to News of the Times. It is 1869 in Pantin, northeast Paris, France. In this episode, we cross the English Channel to look at a massacre of a whole family for monetary gain. The case itself wove backwards and forwards before finally confirming the person who was responsible. The Times, 28th of September, 1869, said, The Pantin Massacre continues to eclipse and push aside every other topic. Paris is mad about it. The excitement caused in London by the most celebrated and sensational crimes perpetrated in England in our day, does not, if my memory serves, anything like equal that which now here prevails. It is a passion, a rage, a fury, an insanity, and some of the papers fill their columns with scarcely anything else. Today we delve into this horrific crime from France. We hope you enjoy the show. The Pantin tragedy consumed the papers in France and England at the time. It all started with the discovery of the bodies. From the Kenilworth Advertiser, the 30th of September, 1869. The Pantin murders. On Monday morning in last week, a labourer living in Pantin, a village just outside the fortifications to the north-east of Paris, was crossing a field on his way to his work, when his attention was called by large pools of blood on a piece of waste ground, a part of which appeared to have been ploughed or dug by an inexperienced hand. Whilst pondering how the blood could have got there, he saw something white under a clod of earth and pulled it out. It was a pocket handkerchief, literally drenched with blood, and on removing it he saw a human hand sticking out of the ground. He ran off to the commissary of police and soon returned to the spot with assistance. Spades having been procured, discovery was made, which struck horror into the hearts of all who beheld it. Six dead bodies successively came to light. Shovelful after shovelful of earth was removed, evidently those of a mother and her five children, all of them literally cut to pieces. The first body discovered was that of a little girl of seven, fearfully hacked about the neck, the second of a boy of about fourteen, the third that of a little girl, a mere baby, the fourth was the body of the mother, a woman of about forty-five, and then two lads of about twelve and sixteen. The bodies had been laid at the feet of each other and were covered by about three feet of earth, and the murderer had tried to give the ground the appearance of ploughed land, forming it into furrows. The victims were all most respectively dressed. One of the boys wore the uniform of one of the lycees. They all had some money in their pockets, the mother's earnings had not been touched, and one of the boys had a watch. The six dead bodies were placed in carts filled with straw and taken to the morgue. For our listeners, it should be noted that the mother was seven months pregnant at the time of her murder. News of the slaughter of a pregnant mother and her five children quickly spread across the area and to England. From the Kenilworth Advertiser, the 30th of September, 1869. From nine o'clock in the morning, thousands rushed thither to endeavour to see the bodies, but they were not to be seen on the inclined slabs of black marble on which the corpses of the unrecognised dead are usually laid, 
but placed in a chamber apart, belonging to the establishment. The police on duty had some difficulty in keeping the people from overcrowding the morgue, where there was but one drowned man to see. The bodies of the murdered family were identified of those of Madame Kink, who resided in Roubaix, and her five children, Emile, aged 16, Henry, 14, Alfred, 8, Achilles, 6, and Marie, 3. Madame Kink was a fine, well-looking woman, not more than 35 years old. As the bodies were discovered, questions were raised as to who could have committed such an atrocious crime. The primary suspect was the father, Jean Kink, and an elder son, Gustave. With both the father and son missing, papers jumped to the conclusion that there had been a rift within the family and that the father, possibly with the help from the eldest child, had lured the mother and children to Pantin from their village, killed them and then buried the bodies in a formation to look like the burial was part of a ploughed field. Investigations worked on back-tracing the steps of the family from their village to Pantin. From the Kenilworth Advertiser, 30 September 1869. On September the 19th, she came to Paris with her children and went to the address given her, the Hotel du Nord, where she asked for Mr. Kink, who was not there. The party then went towards the railway station, and there can be little doubt that they left for Pantin by the train of seven hours and twenty-seven minutes. But in the meantime, they dined at the restaurant of the Ronde Point of the station, whose manager has recognised the bodies. The time taken in going by rail from Ranet to Pantin on the Strasbourg railway is but thirty-one minutes. An employee of the railway deposed that on the arrival of the train at Pantin, at seven hours fifty-eight, he received from a lady with five children five tickets for the third class. There was some discussion about there being only five tickets for six people, but after the explanations of the mother, it was admitted that two of the children were young enough to travel at half price. The hours that elapsed afterwards before their assassinations are not accounted for. The Pantin station is about 300 yards from the spot where the bodies were found buried in the early morning, and one of the employees, Monsieur Coulon, says that about midnight he heard cries of men and women. Five other railway clerks, however, who were up all night, say they heard nothing. A watchman of the factory of Madame and Monsieur Cartier Bruton disposed that he saw by moonlight some people working very hard in the field where the corpses were found up to about four in the morning. It is calculated that the burying of the bodies must have taken a long time, even for very good workmen. A hackney coachman has given information that on the night of the crime he successfully took a lady and a child and then two children and a third time two other children to a spot near Pantin, where somebody was waiting to receive them. It is therefore supposed that the victims must have been murdered separately and dragged to their graves after they were dead. With the route traced, the investigation for the parties who had committed the crimes and what the motive was for the crime was splashed across the papers. The search was on to discover the father, Jean Kink, and the elder son, Gustave, or any other suspicious persons. The ports were watched closely by police, and a suspect was picked up in Havre.
from the Kenilworth Advertiser, the 30th of September, 1869. A letter from Havre states that the man arrested in that town intended to take a passage in one of the packets of the transatlantic company, the Lafayette, which was to start yesterday for New York. He had left Paris on Monday for Havre and passed the days of Tuesday and Wednesday in walking about near the port, waiting for the time to embark. He had even entered an agency office and taken information. The Echo de Robert, speaking of the departure from Robert to Pantin of Madame Kink and her children, related that she was in a joyous humour on leaving. Escorted by several friends, she stated to them that she regarded her visit to Paris as a sort of fete, a party and her children, more happy still, cried out in chorus, We are going to see Papa. The whole interest of this dreadful and most extraordinary crime is now concentrated in the confession of the young man arrested at Havre, and who turns out to be not young Kink, as at first conjectured, but a workman who aided the father and son in massacring the whole family. Jean-Baptiste Tropman Tropman was born in Alsace in 1848 and was 22 years old at the time of the murders. Tropman worked as a mechanic, with Jean Kink being his employer. He had made his way to Havre, ostensibly to travel to the United States, and was picked up by a suspicious gendarme who did not like the look of him and asked for his papers. With no papers on hand and with his shifty behaviour, Trumpman was taken into custody. With some probing by the gendarme, Trumpman cracked and eventually admitted the crime, but, according to his story, he was merely a facilitator to the crime. He stated that he got the tools and prepared the way, but the actual killing of Madame Kink and the children had been done by Father Jean Kink and the elder son Gustave. This was his story which he stuck to. With no sign anywhere of Jean or Gustave Kink, it was difficult to disprove his statement. From the Kenilworth Advertiser, 30th of September, 1869. A certainty has now been arrived at that three persons were associated in the perpetration of this lugubrious drama, although up to this moment only one has been arrested. It is therefore of great importance to avoid all indications calculated to impede the action of justice against the two others. One may, however, say that the reality, to judge from the present state of the examination, will greatly surpass in horror even the most dramatic versions of the story. The three murderers are Jean Kink, the father, Gustave, his son, and a third person who has on several occasions given himself the false name of Jean Kink. This is the man who was so fortunately arrested at Havre by the maritime gendarme Ferrand. The real name of the criminal is Tropman. Papers found in his possession prove his identity and show that he was a working mechanic at Roubaix. His accomplices appear to have made him one of the most active instruments of their crime. He, it was who, had the mission to prepare at Paris the execution of the affair and to direct all the materials and details. He was the man who went on Sunday evening to buy from the ironmonger a shovel and a pickaxe in order to dig beforehand the grave of the victims, and he was the person who engaged a cab to transport to a desert spot 
selected beforehand for the perpetration of the crime, the unfortunate Kink family. This was the man who, according to the pre-arranged plan, had to bring each of the victims one after the other under the knives of the two other murderers. Lastly, he was the person whose business it was to prepare the flight after the deed had been committed. For that object he had come to Havre to find some ship in which he and his accomplices might quit France. According to Tropman, on the instant the father and son together with Trotman rushed upon their victims and a violent struggle immediately commenced between Madame Kink and her executioners. The poor woman, being in the vigour of life and stimulated by the energy which the instinct of self-preservation supplied, succeeded in wrestling the knife out of her husband's hand. She then turned the weapon against him, wounding him in the arm, and would doubtless have contrived to escape had not the other assailants, after having massacred the children, assaulted her in their turn. And so the deed of blood was accomplished. According to the assertions of Trotman, it was not he, but Gustav Kink, who went to fetch his three young brothers from the cab. On the occasion of the first interrogation, attempted at five o'clock in the hospital by the examining magistrate, Trotman persisted in absolute silence. At seven in the morning he underwent an examination, in the course of which he made, as we are assured, a complete confession. Trotman's narrative proceeds. At the same moment, the father plunged his knife into the back of one of his children and then, with the rapidity of lightning, assailed his wife. A long struggle ensued between them, and the prisoner asserts that, without the assistance which he afforded Kink, the latter would have been mastered and perhaps killed by the woman. Trotman refused to go for the other children, so that the son went. This latter first strangled his brother with a silk handkerchief lent to him by the prisoner, and which was a yellow one with flowers on it, similar to that in which he had his money tied up with when he was arrested. The next update comes to the conclusion that Tropman, unsurprisingly, had been lying, and that it was very likely that the father, Jean Kink, and then his son, Gustav Kink, had been murdered a few days prior to the murders of Madame Kink and the five children. From the Kenilworth Advertiser, 30th of September, 1869. Report from the Figaro Correspondent. On the strength of evidence given by a reporter of the Figaro, coupled with a variety of circumstances now reported from Rubin and Havre, I have come to the conclusion that Kink Senior and Gustav Kink Son were innocent, and that in all probability they were themselves assassinated by Trotman several days before the murder of Madame Kink and her five children. The Kinks were a united, happy, amiable family, thoroughly respected by all who knew them, and after the minutest inquiries, it has not been found that any one at Roubaix has a word to say in disparagement of Monsieur or Madame Kink or any one of their children. It is not true that the eldest son, Gustave, was a child of Monsieur Kink by a former marriage. He was full brother to the five murdered children, and instead of being twenty-two, as stated, he was but sixteen. He is described as a sweet-tempered, gentle lad of blameless manners, and it is in the highest degree improbable that such a boy would have had the physical strength and fiendish resolution to plan and execute upon his mother, brothers and sisters such a massacre as that of Pantin.
It is not true that Monsieur Kink and his wife were ever on bad terms. It is certain that the father never arrived at Goubeville, and that the registered letters with the 5,500 francs in it lies in the post office there still. The postmaster says that about three weeks ago, a young man answering the description of Trotman came to the office and asked for a letter for Jean Kink. Are you Jean Kink? he inquired. Yes, was the answer. Then I cannot give you the letter, for I know Jean Kink to be forty-five years of age. Thereupon the young man decamped, and the letter was never afterwards inquired for. As searches continue for the missing suspected dead bodies of the father Jean Klink and Gustave Klink, a discovery is made. From the Manchester Courier, the 30th of September, 1869. The Tragedy at Pantin. It is now beyond all controversy that the body discovered yesterday in Langois Field, at a distance of thirty yards from the spot where Mrs. Kink and her five children were found a week ago, was that of Gustav Kink. Though frightfully mutilated, the face was recognised at the morgue today by a sister of Madame Kink, who arrived from Lille, and it has been also identified by the prisoner Troutman. The latter was brought from the Mazas prison to the morgue, without being told for what purpose. He was suddenly placed in front of the corpse. The judge of instruction closely watched his countenance all the time. The assassin seemed astounded at the sight. When asked if he knew whose body it was, he replied at once, It is Gustav. You killed him? No, the prisoner here exclaimed, Ah, the wretched father, he has murdered his son. This accusation is, of course, not worth a moment's notice. There can be no doubt that Trotman is the murderer of Gustav Kink, and as little doubt that he murdered the father whose body has not yet been discovered. This day the Languat field has been ploughed all over, and ploughed so deep that the horses were greatly strained at the work. A judge of instruction, a commissioner of police, and two or three surgeons watch the operations, but up to four o'clock in the afternoon, no new discovery was made. The police continue to think that Jean Kink must have been assassinated in Alsace while on his way to Goubweiler, where he never arrived. The medical men who made the post-mortem examination of the bodies at the morgue are of the opinion that Gustav, whose body was in an advanced state of decomposition, must have been slaughtered three or four days before his mother. The Discovery of Gustav Kink A carman named Hoogs, living in Pantin, while walking about the field, suddenly felt a clod of earth sink beneath his foot. He knelt down and commenced removing the earth with his fingers and presently came on part of a coat skirt and then on a corpse lying with his face downwards, the arms extended and the fingers contracted to the right hand were still attached to a tuft of black hair. The body was soon completely uncovered and placed on its back. In the neck was seen a fearful wound large enough to introduce two closed hands, and which had almost detached the head from the body, and positively laid open the vertebral column. A common black-handled knife was still sticking in the place. Stooping and using his hands, he removed from the face the earth and clotted blood which had adhered to it. The upper lip bore no traces of a moustache, and the chin had never been shaved. The flesh, however, peeled off, and the hair dropped from the head on being touched. The doctor was consequently obliged to suspend the examination, but not before 
he had remarked that the corpse, which was horribly disfigured, bore traces of a struggle. Three deep wounds were found in the region of the heart, and at the back of the head a deep hole, no doubt produced by a blow from a pickaxe. Monsieur then examined the body more closely. It was that of a young man of about eighteen, wearing trousers of yellowish colour with a black stripe, waistcoat of the same kind, a coat of dark brown fancy stuff, with side pockets all exactly corresponding to the description of the elder son. The cap of brown and violet check was searched for and found in the hole. There could no longer be any doubt that this was the body of Gustav Klink, and if any uncertainty had remained, would have been removed on seeing the light blue knitted vest and the ribbed stockings like those worn by the other children. This seventh corpse had scarcely been found when the population brought stakes with which they formed a railing around the spot. They also fixed in the earth a cross with an image of the Virgin and a wreath of Immortalis. Flowers were also thrown into the enclosure by the bystanders. With the finding of the body of Gustav, Trotman's story of how the murderers unfolded was seen to be a complete fabrication. On the 12th of November, Trotman confessed. He had lured his employer Jean Clink to Paris, where he killed him with prussic acid. He then wrote to Madame Clink, stating that he, Jean Clink, had sprained his wrist which was why he had another writing the letter for him. In the letter, Trotman, under the guise of Kink, asked her to send 5,500 francs by cheque to the post office. When Trotman came to collect the cheque from the post office, he was thwarted as the teller knew Jean Kink and knew that Trotman was not him. Still under the guise of Jean Kink, Troutman next sent another letter requesting cash to be handed to him. Young 16-year-old Gustav was sent with money in hand. He was murdered by near decapitation. Wanting still more money and still under the guise of Monsieur Kink, he requested that Madame Kink herself come to Paris, bringing 55,000 francs with her, for a new life in Paris. Heavily pregnant, Madame Kink, with her five children and belongings, left ostensibly to meet her husband with the five thousand francs in hand. Trumpman slaughtered them all. In France, the headlines spoke of nothing else. Eventually, on the 27th of November, 1869, the body of Jean Kink Sr. was found. In a trial lasting five days, Trotman was found guilty of all eight murders and sentenced to death. The jury, press and judge were unforgiving and he stood little chance of anything other than a full guilty verdict. The execution. Trotman's execution was not without drama. From the Pal Mal Gazette, the 20th of January 1870 The Execution of Trotman For the third time an immense crowd of people flocked up to the prison at La Roque yesterday evening to obtain a good place for the execution of Trotman whose head fell this morning at about seven o'clock Outside the prison the crowd was noisy as such crowds always are but the noise did not awake the prisoner in consequence of the precautions that had been taken to secure him a tranquil night before mounting the scaffold. He slept well last night, but when Monsieur Claude entered his cell at 6 a.m. to tell him that his last hour had arrived, he was already up and writing a letter to his family. He received the fatal announcement without showing much emotion. It was evident that he was struggling hard to remain firm 
in appearance. Before mounting the scaffold, he begged the confessor to convey some message to his family. Up to the last moment, he declared that he had had accomplices, but would not name them. It was only when he had been strapped on the fateful plank that his devilish nature reasserted its way, and it was all that the executioner could do to hold him down and get the head in a proper position. During this short struggle, Monsieur de Paris had his hand bitten by the criminal. Emile, the aide, held Trautman's head, and the next moment the blade descended and the last act in the Pantin tragedy terminated. Jean-Baptiste Trautman was executed by guillotine on the 19th of January, 1870. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, The Pantin Massacre. We really hope you enjoyed the episode. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.